Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Sunday morning service. And we're going to do something, I'm not going to say different because it's something we've done before. We're just going to bring it back. And that is the opening chorus. And this month's opening chorus is Little is Much When God is in It. So let's stand together. We're going to listen to it the first time. Dave's going to play it through because it has a bit of an intro and then just the chorus. So go ahead and play it for us. Go ahead. There was, that was it. No. So there we go. Then it's gonna, there we go. You guys got it? Is that good? All right, Dave, go ahead and start us over. Here we go. Let's sing out the monthly, the chorus of the month. Here we go. All right, sing with me. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. If you'll go in Jesus' name. How about that? Amen. As we celebrate 20 years as a church family, Harvest Baptist Church uh, started 20 years ago this month in 2004. And here we are. God's still keeping us moving along. And uh, just singing that song keeps us, helps us remember that it just started with mustard seed of faith to plant the church, starting out in a basement, then moving into various locations till we ended up here and still going strong for the cause of Christ. All right, you may be seated. We're going to sing that at the opening of every uh, service on Sundays. Uh, Sunday mornings uh, for this month as we celebrate 20 years as a church family. All right, let's keep going. Uh, encouragements, I do not. I do have one, but I can't give it out just yet. So you'll have to come back and see when that encourages, because it could be yours, but I'm not going to tell you. All right, let's keep going here. All right, as you can see, we've got this plate, B, uh, letter blue. Blue starts with the letter B. B stands for Benevolence Fund. Uh, we will be taking our Benevolence Fund offering uh, after the service today. We'll have our regular offering that we have each and every week. Then immediately following that, we'll have the offering for our Benevolence Fund. Uh, that fund has been used in a tremendous way uh, to help people both within and without the church, and that's through, due to the sacrificial giving to those that give to the Benevolence Fund. And again, caring for family and community. Uh, we do have opportunities to help those in need in the community, but we also let them know that their greatest need is the saving grace of Jesus Christ by trusting in him in Him alone for salvation. And that's what it is, the opportunity to witness. We don't make it contingent 
Uh, all right, well, we'll help you out as long as you get saved. We don't want any false professions of faith. But just to introduce people, a lot of times God puts people in those positions to where they know, realize that their need is Jesus. So thank you to those that give. And in accordance to the Benevolence Fund, again, and it's been used tremendously to help people within the church as well in their time of need. And just a great opportunity uh, to demonstrate the love of Christ. All right, tonight, after the service, if you're available, uh, it's popcorn night. We're going to have popcorn tonight after the service, and we're also going to have some ice cream. I've got, I've got two three-gallon buckets of ice cream. We'll use one of them tonight. The other one I want to save. Uh, that, well, these were donated to us, so I want to save the other one for the picnic in a couple of weeks, but we'll, we'll do mu as much damage as we can on, on one of them tonight, along with some popcorn. And those of you that know, it's our little ones that uh, do the serving tonight with the popcorn and the ice cream. So let's be an encouragement to them. Uh, let's show them the joy in serving, uh, serving Jesus as we have our popcorn night. And we got together. We got a, a meeting with the guys there. They said, Pastor, it's time for another popcorn night. So we sit down. We have a meeting in my office. And we look at the calendar. And we, we cry and we sweat. No, we don't do any of that. We just, I say, you want this day or this day? And they pick the day and then we do it. And they pick this one. So tonight after the service, Popcorn Fellowship, if you're able to stay, by all means, come on and do so. It would be a good time of fellowship after the service. And uh, it would be an encouragement to our young boys, teaching them how to serve the Lord. And then, uh, for those of you that have been, last month, for the month of July, I did post it on the Facebook page, uh, the, the reading plan was for Joel. But now we're in August, and the scripture reading for August is the book of Malachi. Now what this is, uh, if you don't know, uh, you're, you're to... Try and read the book of Malachi every day for the month of August, okay? Just read it. It's four chapters. Uh, my wife and I did it yesterday. How long did it take us yesterday? Just minutes, okay? But I'll tell you what, in Malachi, there's some zingers in there, all right? <laughs> there's definitely some zingers. Uh, but take, and, and, and again, the goal isn't to, uh, to say, oh, you failed because you only did it on 28 out of 31 days. But it's just to continue to read that book of the Bible uh, every day for the month as many times as you can. Uh, and then if you take, if you're a note taker, and Anytime something speaks to you, take a note, take a note. Uh, but just to go through that, I've been trying to do that all year long. Take a book that's about four chapters or so, something you can sit through and get through in about 15, 20 minutes, really, if you want to. Uh, it's not too overwhelming, but I'll tell you, Malachi has got some good stuff in it. My wife and I were reading it yesterday. We're both going, ooh, ow, ooh, ow. Yeah, so get ready for that. Uh, it's a good book. It's the last uh, book of the Old Testament. So if you get to Matthew, just turn back to those blank pages and, oh, there it is, Malachi. And it's not Malachi, okay? It's Malachi. So anyways, uh, go ahead and read the book of Malachi every day for the month of August. Yeah, he wasn't an Italian prophet, okay? So, you know, he was a prophet, but he has a wonderful message and it's very applicable to today's day and age. All right. Uh, 20th anniversary coming up. I, I owe you a sign-up sheet because it is going to be a potluck style. Uh, we do have some food that will be prepared, uh, but I need to get a sign-up sheet probably uh, tonight or Wednesday. I'll have one out, and then there will be one next week. We'll get some people signing up to bring some stuff to the potluck. Uh, as you know, we're going to do it old-fashioned Sunday style here at the church for Sunday morning, and then immediately after the service, we'll head on over to the park. And I understand there's going to be some comings and goings uh, for some people. That's okay. Uh, we'll just do it. We'll take it as it comes. We'll have a good day and a nice, safe environment for the children, nice fenced in with the playground and everything going on. And this year, uh, I'll have access to the key to the park. So we'll have, be able to use some more of the amenities there. Uh, looking forward to a good day celebrating 20 years as a body of believers on August the 18th at Defoe Park uh, here in Bay City. So if you have somebody you want to invite, they're more than welcome to come join us. Uh, the more the merrier. And uh, I didn't want to do it this Sunday because we're observing Lord's Supper, but I do have shirts. Uh, if you want to purchase one, we've got from size small, the 2X. Uh, they have the 20th anniversary on there. They're white t-shirts. If you want to buy one, 10 bucks a piece. If you want one, let me know. Well, I'm not going to do it this Sunday, uh, but we'll, we'll be available just hit me up if you want one and we'll get them here uh, soon all right just to represent and celebrate 20 years as a body of believers okay now it is time for us to prepare to observe the Lord's Supper as we do on the first Sunday of every month as we prepare to gather around the Lord's table just as Jesus had commanded in his word this do in remembrance of him and that's why we gather together in the Lord's table. It helps us to realize and to remember why it is that we gather together in the house of the Lord. Gather together, and, you know, without the death, burial, and resurrection according to the scriptures, we have no reason to even be here today. But it's because of Christ's finished work on the cross. 
as we worship him and thank him for what he did, giving us the opportunity for eternal life by trusting in and believing in his name and being saved by faith and through grace in Christ and Christ alone. And that is the ordinance, one of the two ordinances of the local church as we see in the pages of the scriptures. It is One is baptism by immersion after salvation, and the other is observing the Lord's Supper, having an opportunity where we regularly gather together and remember what God did for us. And as the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians, as we gather together to do this, it is also a time of reflection upon the self. Not only do we reflect on what Christ did in his work at the cross of Calvary, but we reflect on our own lives in accordance to our walk with him. A time of reflection of where we're at in our relationship with Christ. You know, husband and wife, that's good to do, have those moments of just uh, getting together and say, where are we at? What's going on? How are things going between us? Uh, most importantly, that you do that with your relationship with the Lord. Donnie, you can go ahead and sit down, buddy. All right, so um, having that relationship with God and doing that with him, and this is a good opportunity to do that. Uh, that's why the Bible says that we should examine ourselves. The Bible says, let a man examine himself. Uh, taking that time to just say, Lord, where are we? How's our relationship? How's it going? And again, this is not a means of disqualification from the Lord's Supper, but as a means of drawing closer to him and realizing, Christ, that you died for me. Uh, you were wrongly accused. You were wrongfully executed. Uh, you were taken prisoner. You were beaten beyond all recognition. Uh, you were mocked as you hung on the cross, as many wagged their heads and said, he saved others, why can't he save himself? And you did all that for me. And he did for each and every one of you. God in his omniscience, his all-knowing nature, he had each and every one of us on his heart and on his mind when he cried out, it is finished, Amen. dying for all of mankind. And for such a great, uh, a great gift, and that's what it is, the gift of eternal life, uh, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The opportunity not only to go to heaven when you die, but to be able to no longer be alone here on this earth, having fellowship with Christ, having the Holy Spirit dwell within you. So with that, I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer here. We will pray, then I'll have the gentlemen come around, and we will begin to observe the Lord's table. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. Oh, Lord, I, I don't thank you enough for the finished work of the cross. And Lord, sometimes we just say it and it comes out as words. Lord, as we just take the time on a day like this as Lord's Supper to really just meditate and think about what you did at the cross of Calvary. Lord, you lived a sinless, perfect life. Lord, if there is anybody undeserving in this world, it is you. But yet, Lord, you became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, because you saw through to the joy that comes to the opportunity to dwell with you for all eternity in a place called heaven. And not only that, Lord, but you promise us the peace that passes all understanding. You promise us uh, joy unspeakable. You tell us our cup runneth over, all because of what you did at the cross and as we trust in and rely upon you. So, Lord, again, as we examine ourselves here today, help us to draw closer to you. As your word promises, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And, Lord, as we continue to do that, as you do your perfecting work in and through us, Lord, just help us to love you more because of what you did for us. Just as your word says, we love you because you first loved us and gave your life as a propitiation for our sins. So help us now, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Gentlemen. In just a moment here, uh, I'm going to have uh, Brother Bill pray over the bread, and um, then we will distribute the elements, and then we'll partake in the bread after the reading of the scripture, and then I'll have Paul pray over the juice. We'll distribute the juice uh, after the reading of the scripture, and then we'll partake of that. So, Bill, you please lead us in prayer over the bread.
The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Well, Paul, will you please lead us in prayer over the cup? Heavenly Father, we uh, remember today the great sacrifice that your son Jesus made on our behalf. Uh, we uh, Sometimes people say that why do bad things happen to good mm -hmm. people, but we really should be saying why do good things happen to bad people, mm -hmm. because we're all bad in the fact that we've sinned. And we still continue to sin. And um, our sin was laid upon our Savior and he suffered in our place. The word tells us who his own self bear our sins yes. in his own body on the tree and on the cross. And we just thank you today for our Savior uh, dying in our place and shedding his blood for our sins. We uh, pray these things together. Amen. The Bible says in the very next verse, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup <clears throat> is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. As the gentlemen collect the elements, let us all stand together. We'll sing our first song this morning. Number 111 in your hymnal, Lead Me to Calvary.
and take the Lord in prayer. Dear God in heaven, we do thank you for this beautiful day you have given us, Lord. Uh, thank you for this house of God. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for the, everyone that's come out here today to worship you, Lord. And we just pray at this time, help us take every song and everything that's done to you, Lord, to be your honor and glory, dear God. And just challenge us, Lord, to be more like thee and just work in us and through us, Lord. And think of those that can't be here, Lord, today, Lord, that want to be here, Lord. Maybe those are sick or traveling, Lord. Just be with them. Comfort them. Be with them. Uh, bring them back next point in time. And uh, we just pray, Lord, for just a great day today. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Remain standing as we turn to our next song, number 115. 115. Wounded for me. I'm going to get everybody used to standing. I'm going to have you sit back down. I'm messing with everybody today. 115. <laughs> time now for our scripture reading. Amen. Good morning, everybody. We'll be in Job 23 today. Job 23. The scripture reading. All right, Job 23, the Bible says, uh, Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter, my stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with this great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he did, doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath uh, held his steps, his way uh, have I kept, and have not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips? I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. But he 
is in one mind, and who can turn him in what his soul desire? I'm sorry, and sorry, in what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. For he performeth a thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore am I troubled at his presence. When I consider I am afraid of him, for God maketh my heart soft, and the Almighty troubleth me, because I was not cut off before the darkness, neither hath he covered the darkness from my face. Uh, we see, see, if you read the book of Job, uh, obviously we you know Job lost everything but his wife um, in the book of Job. And then he has his friends, he has quite a few friends here, a few friends that are basically going back and forth with him saying, look, uh, you're the problem, Job. You know, you you're the one that's you know God did this to you because you're the problem. You you know you're sinful. You're you know you did something. God just wouldn't do this to anybody. So basically, he, he, they're, they're, his friends are blaming him. You know how bad is that? You lose everything, and your friends are blaming you, right? Your friends are against you, right? Uh, Job is in a dark corner. Job is in a dark spot. Um, he basically, he wants God right now. He's like, God, where are you? You know, I want to meet you with you one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, we all know God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. But sometimes you just feel like, where are you? You ever feel that way? Like, where, where are you, God? Where are you? I, I, I just, where are, you know, where are you at? I need you right now, God, and you're just not there for me, right? My friends don't want, you know, are basically against me. And everyone's just, everywhere I go, it's like everything's against you, right? He wants that one, you ever feel that one-on-one -on -one time with somebody? Just one-on-one, -on -one, right? Me and you, Donnie, right? Let's hash this out, buddy, right? Let's hash it out, right? You want that sometimes, right? Like, where are you, God? Uh, you want that. And uh, this is where Job's at. He's at a place where I want one-on-one. -on -one. I want I want you to, to uh, God, hear my sorrow, hear my hurt. Uh, he wants someone to listen to, right? Everybody there, just listen to me, please, right? And that's where we see uh, where Job is at right now. He's at that place where he just wants to be heard. He's in a hurtful place. He's he's sorrowful, and he just wants someone to listen to him. And sometimes we just need to be that way. It feels like um, he feels like, almost like God's hiding from him. You see that as we read the scripture here. It's like I go, I turn this way, I turn that way. It's like he can't find God. It's like God, where are you? He just as we read through the scriptures there, um, he mentioned in the verses here. He goes to the, what does it say here? Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And then backward, I can't perceive him. He's just like, he's just, he feels anywhere he goes, God's just not there. Um, he feels that way. Um, Job 23.10 is by my favorite verse in the book of Job, um, at least in this uh, chapter, probably the whole, whole book at least. Um, it's a great verse. And it said, I'll read to you again. It says, uh, but he knoweth the way that I take, and he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. What a great verse, right? What a great verse to think that um, he, just an amazing verse. If you look at that and study that out, he knoweth the way that I take, right? The great, the greatest thing about gold is gold does not fear the fire. <laughs> gold doesn't fear the fire, does it? It doesn't fear the fire. Uh, the, uh, it's just an amazing thought there. Uh, why? Because um, we see also, the, if we look at the furnace there, uh, the furnace is the only way, right? The heat, the furnace is the only way to make that gold uh, pure and brighter. Right, so if you if you want to be pure, you want to be brighter, you have to go through the fire. Right, as we go through the fire, God knows how much heat we can handle. Right, some of us can't handle much heat. Right, uh, but He knows how much heat you can handle. He knows how much you can handle. Right, He's not going to turn it up to you know a thousand degrees and you want to handle five hundred. Okay, <laughs> so He knows how much heat you can handle. Okay, and He can turn He can turn down any time. Right, if he, just, if he turns the heat up on you. You can turn it down too, right? So we, isn't that an amazing thought that God just knows exactly what you need? So and He knows that thing. So when you're going through the furnace too. Of afflictions, you have two choices, right? As you go through the, through the trials and afflictions of life, you have two choices, right? Are you going to submit to his word and, and to his will? Are you going to do that? Or are you going to resist his word and his will, right? You have two choices. You can go through it and resist it and, and, and basically go through the right way, or you can resist it. And if you submit, um, if you submit, then you will be nourished and it will make you better. Yes. You want to be nourished, be better? As you go through the fire, you go through the furnace, just endure it, have a good attitude about it. If you, if you resist it, though, uh, you'll be burnt by the fire, and you'll be bitter. Okay? Uh, who wants to, I don't want to be burnt, do you? I, want, I think you want to be better. Um, you want to be nourished. right? So as you go through the fire, uh, realize that Job 23.10, again, it's a great verse to look at. As we're all going through the fire in different times of our life, different th reasons, um, but as you're going through the fire, remember, he wants you to be pure gold. He wants you to be pure and brighter for him and serve him more and do more. Um, so make sure as you go through it, you have the right attitude, you handle it properly, and you just uh, have, it's right, all about attitude, right? Have the right attitude, and as you go through that fire. So just a little challenge for you from uh, of Job there. And as you get uh, later in Job, I believe it's like chapter 38 or something, eventually God's going to come to him. God's going God's to meet with him and talk to him, and uh, he's going to meet with God. So you just got to go through it, and God's going to be there for you. So. All right, let's stand together as we sing our final song this morning, number 131, Jesus Paid It All, number 131. <clears throat> I 
Seated Junior Church, you are dismissed. <coughs> the rest of us, we open our Bibles to the book of 1 Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> First Peter chapter number 4. We're going to start in verse number 12. Title of today's message is we continue the overall writing theme of knowing God. That's been the theme of 2024 is knowing God, not just knowing about God, not just knowing facts about him, not just knowing things about him, but actually knowing him, working on our personal relationship with God. And as we've been going through 1 Peter, it's been knowing God through trials. And we see that that's the theme of what Peter's been encouraging the believers during this time, knowing God through trials. And today, we come to the realization as we look at verse number 12 through 19, the remainder of the chapter, is that we're in good company when it comes to trials and tribulations. Uh, I thought this was appropriate. I did not intentionally uh, plan for today's message to fall on the day of the Lord's Supper, but very appropriate nonetheless. So let's take a look. Let's read these verses. 1 Peter chapter number 4, starting in verse number 12. Where the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But... Rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you, to live for you, because you died for us. And Lord, sometimes that staying faithful and following you involves difficulties, tragedies, trials, tribulations, heartache, stomach aches, misery, woe, but yet 
Lord, uh, as just as Bill had read in Job chapter 23, as we stick in the refiner's fire, we can come forth as gold. And that is your plan and your purpose as we go through these things. So Lord, help us as we go through these trials to draw nigh to God as you will draw nigh to us. Help us to cleanse our hands and purify our hearts. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, as we see in 1 Peter chapters 1 through 3, uh, the overall theme of what he's been talking about and writing this letter to the persecuted Christians scattered abroad during that time. He is assuring them that their living hope comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And nothing's changed here today. Our living hope comes through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. On Wednesdays during our Bible study, we've been looking at Christ types in the Old Testament. And I've been encouraging ourselves as we go through this not to look at these things as particular uh, trinkets of information or uh, ways we can answer trivia questions. But what it does is it solidifies the consistency of the scriptures. And it shows that God is the same from the beginning as he is in the end. And it shows that all the while he is showing us a picture of his son, Jesus Christ, which is our living hope. Just as it was theirs, it is ours today. He is our living hope. Uh, and again, it reminds us our living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Also, the inheritance that we have is imperishable in heaven on high. Also, uh, that we uh, have emphasized the necessity of trials, explaining that they test the genuineness of our faith. Sometimes that is the trial to test our faithfulness. You know, that's the question you need to ask yourself is, what would it take to get you to stop following God? Unfortunately, for all of us, there's probably something. But when you ask that question as a time of self-reflection and examination, you need to find out what that is and rid yourself of it. You know, I, you've heard me say it before. There was a time I said, God, you can have everything in my life, but you cannot have my kids. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. And God convicted me of that through the scriptures when it says children are an heritage of the Lord. They belong to him. You know, there would have been a time I said, God, if you take my children, I am done serving you. But that's not the case. Uh, they are his to have. You know, my mom has, there was a brother before me that was, that's in heaven today, died at uh, two and a half years old. Uh, and yet, you know, uh, sometimes mom says, yeah, I know that uh, I gave up one son uh, to heaven, but I gave up the other son to serve the Lord, you know, and uh, she, she admits that from time to time. But again, understanding that, uh, that, uh, you know, whatever it is that would get you to stop serving God, it's not a point of recognition, but it's a point of reflection to say, all right, there it is. How do I rid myself of this idol in my life? And again, chapter number two, we see that uh, Peter, again, tells us that the trials are a test of our faith, but we are to live as God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This involves uh, pursuing that holiness. And we talked also about the holiness is not a suit and tie. It's not a haircut. It's not in our dress. It's not in anything in the external, but in the internal, as we allow God to transform us uh, through his sanctifying work. And sometimes that is through trials. And we are to abstain from sinful desires and live honorable lives among the unbelievers. Okay? Remember, it's a testimony to show the world that we, in fact, live uh, through Christ, and that we don't need uh, uh, to, to follow the ways of the world because we have one that has overcome the world, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, we are to live righteously. It shows that we are to submit ourselves unto the authorities, and we talked about uh, as the, submitting to the authorities in society uh, as so long as, you know, again, we'll say so long as it doesn't go against the Bible, but we still submit to them by going through the consequences of staying faithful to Christ. We looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they submitted to the authority. They would not bow down uh, to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, but they were submissive to the authority by entering into the fiery furnace, and God preserved them. Uh, the same thing with Daniel. Uh, they made the, uh, the law where you could not pray, uh, but yet Daniel prayed, and he submitted to the authority by going into the lion's den. And there will be times in our life where we have to choose to obey the scriptures and follow through with the consequence and trust in God that he will preserve us uh, in these endeavors. But also, uh, we are to live righteously, endure unjust suffering, following his Christ's example who suffered for us, Again, leaving us an example that we are to follow. 
Then in chapter 3, we see here that uh, he gives us instructions for harmonious relationships. Uh, We saw that it's one thing to be a good testimony out in the community. It's a good thing to be a testimony out in the church. But the testimony begins within the home, where we talked about wives submitting unto their husbands. And he talks about uh, how to submit to an unbelieving spouse, that through our conversation, through our behavior, they may be one unto the Lord. That uh, being submissive or submitting one to another in the household uh, does not mean being tolerable of sin. As a matter of fact, setting boundaries and taking stands for the cause of Christ. You know, we've got this idea in this world today that that love is just a sense of open permissiveness, but it's not. Uh, Just as I wouldn't uh, permit one of our young ones to escape from the nursery and run into busy Salzburg Avenue and just say, well, that's what makes them happy. Just let them go. No, I would go and I would grab them and pull them back. They would be screaming. They would be crying. They would be mad at pastor, but they would be alive, right? <laughs> All right? And, and, and that's what it talks about in First Peter where it says, you know, fear not their terror, right? When it comes to taking a stand for Christ and saying, you know what, uh, you are not going to be involved in this sin and they're going to throw a fit and they're going to go nuts and they're going to raise all kinds of cane. Oh, well, Oh, well, take that stand. Fear not their terror. Stand for the cause of Christ. And then finally, building on this foundation, Peter then begins talking about the deeper understanding of suffering. And that's where we get in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. I love here that he reminds them that they are beloved. Let us not forget that. You see, God is not putting us through these trials as some kind of torture test. I remember that my sister, uh, who's almost nine years older than me, uh, you know, and I was a brat little kid. Sometimes she'd, she'd pin me down on the floor uh, and she'd hold my hands down and she'd go, Chinese torture test. And she's there and point, poke on my chest. Ah, Wendy, knock it off, right? Uh, and that's not how God is in our life. He's not sitting there, you know, saying, you know, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. He's not doing that. He's not holding you at arm's length as you try to swing away and laughing at you. That's not what God is doing. We are beloved, okay? There is a purpose in our suffering. There is a purpose and what it is that we're going through when the time comes of our trials and our tribulations, and it's this. Trials are a way of refining our faith and bringing glory to God. That's what we need to remember. Uh, He begins urging the believers to see this fact and emphasizing that trials are integral to our spiritual growth and to our witness to the world, okay? We can't live like the world and live in the world's ways, showing uh, no uh, 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 evidence of shining as lights in the darkness and then expect people to see the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we have to understand that in this world in which we live, as things are changing in this world, there are people today that do not even understand, know who Adam and Eve is. What is that? They don't know anything about Jesus. They might know the name Jesus, but they don't understand who he is. Let alone know the difference between the Old and the New Testament. Let alone know what it means to be saved, right? So we don't live in an age and in a society that fears God anymore. And we have to get them to that position. The saying goes, you got to get them lost before you can get them saved. But before you can even get them lost, that you have to get them to understand that there's an authority in which to wish we have to submit and his judgment is coming. And we must understand that. And as we try to blend in with the world as opposed to standing out from the world and shining those lights and the world sees no difference, no difference whatsoever, they're going to ask the question, why do I need God? Why do I need any of this? You do the exact same things I do. You respond the exact same way to trials and tribulations that I do. You uh, run to the same vices that I do. Why do I need God too? It just seems like a bunch of rules and regulations to getting in the way of what I really want to do. So again, we must do that, Uh, you know, emphasizing that it's a part of our spiritual growth and our witness to the world as we align our lives more closely with Christ's suffering and ultimate victory. Again, trials are a way of refining our faith and bringing glory to God. Let's begin. The fiery trial right there in verse number 12, chapter number four. Beloved, look at this. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Did you get that? Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. And look at this. He says this, as though some strange thing happened unto you. A lot of times our response to the fiery trial is, Lord, why me? Why not me? Okay. (laughs) The only thing I deserve is an eternity in hell. I should not take God's grace for granted, nor should I take Christ's gift of salvation for granted. Uh, and, 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 and again, that should be the response. Instead of why me, why not me? 
You know, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, right? So when we see ourselves going through these particular instances in our life, be it known that it's because God cares for you and he loves you and he's trying to work something in you and through you. I was, sometimes I read some articles in regards to management, employees, employers, or whatnot. Uh, every once in a while, I get to work with HR at work. And, you know, part of the things is, well, how do we retain candidates? How do we find good candidates? And just working on those things. And one of the articles I read was this is, you know, the time to start worrying at work is not when the boss is starting to get after you. It's when he stops. Because it means, you know what? I'm done trying to reach you. There's nothing I can do. I'm just waiting for the moment for you to go out the door. Finding a way to fire you. You know, it's those times in our life when God says, you know what? Forget it. I've given you trial. I've given you tribulation. And, and just like David, just like we learned with David in, in 1 Samuel chapter 28, where David thought, hey, this was a great idea. I'm dwelling in the land of the Philistines. Saul isn't pursuing me anymore. My plan must be perfect because it's working out just great. Not only that, we get to dwell in the wilderness of the Philistines and they don't even ask any questions. And if they do ask questions, we can lie to them and they believe our lies. But it all came home to roost. Be sure your sin will find you out. Uh, there came a time now where the king of the Philistines said, hey, David, you're such a good and loyal subject. Now you can stand alongside with me and you can fight the Israelites, the very people to whom you are supposed to be anointed king. It all came home to roost because, again, be sure your sin will find you out. You think you may be getting away with it for a time, but only for a time. Just as Moses said, he would not enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but would rather suffer the reproach right? To follow through with God's will. So again, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. You know, he starts by addressing this because believers are experiencing and he's encouraging them not to see it as something unusual. Now, this isn't a pessimistic mindset. Okay, a, well, it figures, well, if, if something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong. That's not what that is. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, don't think it's strange. Understand that we live in a sin-filled, uh, wicked world that is run by the prince of the power of the air, that has had generations from the days of Adam of sin bled, uh, bred into its uh, mainstream of its veins throughout all of time, even unto us today. We live in a sin-filled, wicked world. But not only that, but it's that God loves us and he's trying to uh, help grow us in our faith, to draw us closer to him. And a lot of times these trials are to purge us from something that doesn't need to be there. You heard Bill talk about it in the refiner's fire. We'll, we'll see it here in just a moment as well. That when you put the gold in the fire, the impurities come to the surface as they are skimmed off. And when you pull it out, you have gold that is more pure than when it, before it went into the fire. The same is true for me and you. You see, and you know, again, in American society today, this is very unusual. Trials might not look like overt persecution, but can include you know, some kind of ostracism, some kind of setbacks, or... Sometimes just a, a strange look or just being ostracized by those around you. We don't face the persecution that others face in this world today. You know, in North Korea, if you even have a piece of literature that talks about God, uh, not only you, but your entire family can be put into prison. Uh, and it's not prison like we have here in the United States. It's hard labor where you're determining, should I eat this rat or should I eat this dirt, right? And, and, and not only that, they say, well, if you're bad, your whole family lineage must be bad, so now everybody goes to prison. All for holding a piece of literature that proclaims the name of God. doesn't even have to be a Bible. You know, and there's many other countries like that. We talk about the 1040 window in regards to missions, and those are nations that are opposed to the gospel, where they can be put in jail, put in prison, or killed for just proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. But yet here we have the freedom to proclaim the gospel freely. We can advertise that we are having church, not only here but on social media, and tell others as well. We can wear clothing that demonstrates the love of God freely and openly. We can pray uh, as we ought, uh, any place we can, but yet there are still trials in this life in which we go through. And when we go through those things, we should rejoice in suffering. Notice the tone here in 1 Peter chapter 4. This does not sound like the tone that uh, I would particularly take with anybody going through a trial. But he says here in verse 13, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of the glory of God resteth upon you. On their part his evil is spoken of, but on your part is he is glorified. Four times he talks about rejoicing and being happy and being filled with joy during a trial. 
Now, this is not Peter suggesting, fake it till you make it, okay? This is not Peter uh, telling the believers, happy face, right? You know, even when you're going through trouble, no, nope, happy face. But I think sometimes as believers, this becomes a, a bit of a struggle when we're going through trials because we want to put on a false persona because we take a wrong application of the scripture here and we look at this and we say, well, the Bible says I should be happy. The Bible says I should rejoice. So, yep, I'm, I'm good. I'm just kind of going through it. You know, kind of those kind of things. That's not what he's saying. And I'll tell you, that's very frustrating for the Christian to kind of have that mindset. Fake it till you make it. Well, I'm just going to act like I'm enjoying it. I'm going to act like I'm, I'm filled with joy. Uh, but you know what? Then you get frustrated. This is miserable. Then you start to turn on yourself. I must be a terrible Christian if I can't rejoice in this tribulation. You know, Jesus wept. Okay? So did he fail in that tribulation? Because Was he supposed to be clicking his heels? Yay, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> no. He said in this day God will be glorified. He knew it was going to happen, but yet he still cried. That's why God made us emotional beings. We can have sadness. We can have heartache. We can have misery. We can have woe. We can have all of those things. But that's not what he's talking about here in regards to rejoicing and suffering. Uh, you know, it can, it can it make us uh, scratch our heads in what that looks like. But what it encourages believers to do is in rejoicing that we are sharing in Christ's suffering, but understanding that we are in good company when we rejoice. Now, this isn't misery loves company. But saying, you know what, I am in a position just like Christ was when he suffered for me. And now I am suffering for his sake, for his name. And I will be stronger because of it, because of the work that he is doing in me and through me. See, the idea of rejoicing and suffering is countercultural. Okay? Especially in today's day and age where we've been sold a prosperity gospel. You know, trust Jesus, all your problems will go away. Trust Jesus and you'll get everything you've ever wanted in life. Trust Jesus, and it's a false bill of goods. And I tell you, many are frustrated and struggling in their faith because of this false theology and wrong mindset. The idea of rejoicing and suffering means finding joy in hardships because these trials connect us to Christ's own suffering and lead to spiritual growth and future glory. Okay? Saying, this is miserable. I'm going through this pain now. You know, it reminds me, uh, you know, 25 years ago, I was in a boating accident, fell off the front of a boat, and I got hit by the propeller on the back of the legs. Okay? I still don't have feeling in the backs of my legs to this day. But uh, the idea is this, is I had to go through some pain uh, to get made well. I had to have uh, 99 staples in my legs. Uh, I couldn't walk for a period of time. And when I did, it felt like I had books in the backs of my legs because I, you know, everything was trying to heal. But I knew that as I stood up and began to walk and as I had those staples put in me, as painful as they were, I knew they were a part of making me well one day. Okay, and that's the way we need to look at trials and tribulations is, is sometimes it's God uh, putting the staples or the sutures in our life to in turn make us well one day because there's something in our life that needs to be purged from us or it's something in our life that helps draw us closer to him. So it doesn't mean that we're sitting here clicking our heels singing zippity doodah when tragedy happens in this life. By no means should that be the case. But when the trials and tribulations come, you know that you have the hope in Christ, a God you can turn to and trust in and know that he is there with you and he is filled with compassion. He hurts when you hurt. He weeps when you weep. He's sad when you're sad, but yet he's there saying, come unto me and draw yourself unto me and trust in me and I will walk with you and you are not going through this alone is what he's saying. And as we do this, you will draw closer to me and as we uh, purge these things and, and, and go through the refiner's fire, you will come out on the other side better than when you were at the beginning. And that, again, that's what it talks about Christ, uh, despising the shame, seeing through the cross unto the joy that was set before him. Uh, that's what we read earlier is that he said, you know what, uh, let this cup uh, be for me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He knew what he was entering into, but he knew what was on the other side. And that's the same thing, the way that we can rejoice in suffering. Sharing in Christ's suffering involves facing opposition, facing hardship, facing discomfort. Oh, I tell you, that's the bane of American society. Uh, we think that God's purpose is to make us comfortable. Couldn't be farther from the truth. It's as a matter of fact, when we get too comfortable, that God disrupts us and gets us out of our rut. 
But yet we think that a life of comfort is what Jesus died for. No, it's a life of Christ-honoring character is what he's called us unto. You see, uh, discomfort for what? For the sake of living out and standing up for Christian values and beliefs. Now, Peter's going to get to it here, and so are we. Uh, you know, we, we rejoice in our suffering, and also we see in verse 14 the blessing of reproach. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. This reminds me of the two uh, disciples that got beaten. Uh, for following Christ, and they got up singing and rejoicing on their way in the book of Acts. They said, wow, we were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. We were beaten for the Lord's sake, and they moved on with their way. You see, uh, being reproached for the name of Christ is actually a badge of honor, knowing that you're standing on the right side. When we are reproached for Christ, we are blessed. This is because the Spirit rests on us, bringing comfort and strength. In America, this might seem like facing criticism or exclusion for our faith, yet we can find happiness and knowing God's presence is with us. You know, taking a stand at work. Uh, I, by, praise be to God that I have not had to do that. My, my employer knows what I do, what, I, what I'm all about. I've got a Bible at work. I've got Bible verses, all of that. Um, and there's many other people of, of, of faith that I work with, and that's a good thing. But I have been uh, in workplaces trying to take a stand for faith and have been called to do uh, things that would have been unethical and had to take a stand for it. I remember talking to Pastor Wall one day at uh, Foster A. Baptist Church. Hey, uh, you know, my boss is wanting me to do this, but it's not right. He says, well, don't do it and just see where it goes from there. And, uh, you know, and that's what I did. Took that stand and uh, eventually was laid off. So, uh, again, you know, but uh, to God be the glory because it led to, actually it led to where I'm at today. So, you know, all these things come into play. And when you're reproached for the sake of Christ, and that's what we need to do. We need to understand happiness and knowing God's presence is with us, okay? And he's with you when you are standing for the cause of Christ, when you're standing for the sake of the gospel. And that's what he's getting here. Uh, you know, but rejoice in as much ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings in that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be made glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but look at this, but on your part he is glorified. You know, in society today, you know, you're going to hear it a lot, especially, uh, unfortunately, as we get into a political season, you know, attacking Christianity, attacking Christian beliefs. Uh, you're going to be called uh, intolerant. You're going to be called a hate monger. You're going to be called judgmental. You're going to be called many things, but so long as you are standing for the cause of Christ, happy is the Lord, and he may be evil spoken of, but on your part, let God be glorified. Taking a stand for the cause of Christ, standing against the evils of this world. And you might be sitting here thinking, well, what if the other side wins? What if everything happens in, uh, contrary to the word of God? Stand for Christ anyways. Stand for Christ anyways, because... Suffering for sin and for Christ's sake, trials should bring about a season of self-reflection. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Okay, isn't this interesting? Two things here. One, this kind of goes back to what he was talking about earlier in the, in the, in the epistle where he says, you know, use not your liberty, okay, uh, to, 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 to do anything other than that which is glorifying to God. But he also says, you know, don't rely on the old man. Don't turn to the lust of the flesh. Don't go the old ways and, and don't do any of that. Don't follow those ways because you're a new creature. You're born again, called to exonify, exemplify and, ex, and, and, and glorify God through this trial. It should bring about a season of reflection because he says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, saying you can't go and commit the crime of murder and then say when you are punished, this is a trial. Oh, I don't know why I'm going through this trial. Oh, why does God bring this suffering upon me, right? Not as a murderer, okay? Uh, how about not as a thief? Maybe murder is a little bit extreme, but a thief, you know, you can't do something unethical or steal or, or do something contrary. You know, it always used to make me cringe. Uh, we'd go to RU Friday nights, and it'd be testimony time. And you'd hear somebody say, oh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what was going to happen. The bills were on the table, and I didn't know how they were going to be met, and I didn't know how they were going to be paid. And Oh, so I just prayed to God. And lo and behold, I went out to the mailbox, and my student loan check was in the mail. Hallelujah. 
your student loan check is not to pay bills, it's to pay for your education. But all these people would, would pray about that, you know, and, and they would use those wrong means and then wonder, why am I having such struggle? Why am I having so many problems? Well, because you're doing things contrary to, to the way God has you doing them. Or as a thief, right, it says there, or as a thief um, or as an evildoer. How about this, though? Isn't that interesting, a busy body and other men's matters? Sticking your nose in other people's business is along the lines of an evildoer, as a thief, or even as a murderer. They're all grouped into one thing. Mind your own business, right? Well, pastor, you know, I'm just concerned. I'm just, no. There's biblical instructions for how to go about doing those things, okay? Uh, But yet, he's saying, when you get yourself involved in those things and it blows up in your face, you can't stand back and say, well, I'm going through a trial. I'm going through a tribulation. What's God going to do in me and through me? No. Again, that's the time for self-reflection. Because it says in verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. You see, we must take that time for reflection. You know, instead of saying, God, why me? Say, God, what me? In the the regards of this, okay, God, is there anything in my life that has brought this trial upon me? And you have to be honest. You have to be honest with yourself. How are you going to lie to God? Well, God, you know, uh, I should get some special exemption because I'm special. No, you're not. You're not special. Okay, nothing changes. God is no respecter of persons. And you know, you know, okay? So just get it out there and get it right with God. The book of Malachi, which we'll be reading through the month of August, chapter 3, verse uh, 2 and 3 says, But who may uh, abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. You see, Peter is just talking about the idea that there should be some time of self-reflection, because I'll tell you what, so many times we think our trial and tribulation is about changing everything and everyone around us, right? I'm sorry, the world does not revolve around you. That'd be too much pressure if it did, okay? God is not thinking, oh, I'm going to put you through this trial because everything else around you needs to change. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. God says, I'm going to put you through this trial because there's something you need to change about you, okay? But think about this. How much in your life is dependent upon other people doing something different than what they're doing now? That's no way to live. Well, as soon as so-and-so does this, and soon as such-and-such does that, and soon as you're never going to get there. Nothing's ever going to change because God is not concerned about everybody else. He's concerned about you, okay? And and he needs you to do that, that time of reflection because judgment begins at God's house. Peter really gets down to it in verse 17, and he's really kind of bringing it home here. You know, he's going on and on and on about just talking about the purpose of the trial, everything he's trying to draw out of the Christian in the trial, and that this is not anything strange concerning you. And, and we talked about it at the beginning of the series in First Peter was, we need to come to the point where we accept the terms and conditions that we live in a sin-filled, wicked world, and trials are a part of the Christian life. And they are to be to God's glory, and they can be good for us. As the book of Romans says, for we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose that even though things are bad in this world and bad things happen god can use them for good so long as we submit and surrender and here's why verse 17 for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of god and if it first begin at us what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of god and then in verse 18 it says and if the righteous scarcely be saved where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear believers are held to a higher standard we can go through the Sermon on the Mount again, where Christ went through it and told us exactly that. You have heard that it hath been said, but I say unto you, the standard of the law is here, the standard of Christ is here. But we, we mix that up. Oh, the law is the law. We'll get into that after this because we're going into Galatians. We're going to talk a lot about that. And we're the land of grace. No, grace is here, okay? The law, grace is here. And we are held to a higher standard. The Christian is held to a higher standard reflecting God's holiness, and this also serves as a warning to unbelievers. If God is willing to do that and work through believers such a way, what is he going to do to those that believe not the gospel? You see, this is where it it turns to, well, love is love, and I don't know how God could let anybody uh, go to hell and why he just doesn't let everybody in, but he says, oh, wow, if he holds the Christian who is born again under the blood of Christ to this standard, 
what standard am I held to? It's called the Lamb's Book of Life, right? To those that have not believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it should cause us for a time of repentance because God is dealing with us and working in us and through us. And not only to develop a healthy Christian, but also to develop a healthy church. You know, and, and, and going through those trials and purging those types of things and getting people to get right with God and to purge the sin from their lives and, and laying that sin aside and not excusing it and not allowing it to make, uh, make uh, you know, justification for it because there is none. Because God, right there, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. God will bring judgment upon your life if you choose to maintain and stay in that sin. He will do that, and, and the idea is not because he is mad. I mean, he's upset at the sin, but because he loves you, and he doesn't want you to have any part of that. You know, that's another thing, talking about uh, RU, and I will tell the guys, I, I used to get the guys that would be put in the RU home, and sometimes they were there voluntarily, sometimes they were there by a court sentence, and so on and so forth. But the first thing I would tell them, as I say, listen to me, and I know that you know this, but you guys are the lucky ones, because you get another chance. And I know that you know people that did not get another chance because they played around too long and their time was up. And that's what we need to realize. When God loves us, when he chastens us, when he allows us to reap what we sow, when he puts us through a trial and the refiner's fire to try and cleanse us and purge us from the sin that besets us, we are in a good position because God cares for you and he's trying to do a work in you and through you and draw you closer to him. And that's the wonderful place to be in. And we see that. So that brings us to this commitment to God. Here's what we do. Verse 19, wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Trust God with our lives and continue to do good knowing that he is faithful. Saying, you know what, Lord, as all of this is crumbling around around me, as long as I'm going through this trial, I will keep on serving you anyways. It's your but if not moment. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, you know what, we're going to go into that fiery furnace and God's going to deliver us. But if not, we still won't bow down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Having, you know, I asked you two questions today. One, uh, what's it going to take for you to stop serving God? Find out what that is and purge it from your life. Uh, number two, what is it going to be your but if not moment? Saying, you know what, God, I'm going to stay faithful to you even if and say, you know what, even if you, and then fill in that blank and say, even if you do that, I'm still going to stay faithful. I'm going to follow you and trust in you with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding. And we do that as we continue to trust him with our life, continue to do good, knowing that he is faithful, maintaining a healthy walk with him, and contribute to a healthy church by living out his principle. And we do that by this, examining our trials. Instead of asking God why, ask him what. Okay? Rejoicing and suffering, understanding that we're not happy at the calamity that has befallen us. We're not happy at the discomfort that we're going through, but we're happy in knowing that God is doing a work in us and that as we come through the other side, we will be closer to him and more like Christ. And as we maintain our commitment to God, allowing him to work in you and through you to bring you closer to him and reflect his glory. And this is a tremendous witness. And by applying this, we can navigate our trials, we can draw closer to him, we can glorify him. And the goal of our trials is not to escape them, but to allow God to work in us and through us, that we may glorify God, live his purpose, and love people well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time we have together. Lord, I thank you that we should not think it strange, the fiery trial in which we're going through. Lord, I thank you that you love me enough that you're willing to deal with me and you're allowing me to reap what I sow in my life. But Lord, I ask that to, you know, as we come through these difficult times, as we go through these trials, to be a time of reflection and self-examination. And instead of, Lord, asking you why, we should ask you what? Lord, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to learn? Lord, what do you want me to do to glorify your name and continue to maintain a healthy witness as I am light shining in the darkness? And Lord, help us as we find those matters to where, uh, you know, we're reaping the rewards of our own sin, that not to call that a tribulation, but yet, Lord, a time of purging and judgment upon us. And Lord, I thank you for that as well, because Lord, you could leave us to our own devices and let us just carelessly go into our own destruction. But Lord, you love us and care for us because of what you did through your son, Jesus Christ, at the cross of Calvary. 
So, Lord, wherever we're at in our walk, if there's anywhere where we're at, uh, Lord, if we're going through a trial, Lord, help us to just have that time of reflection and examination. Lord, help us to resolve to be committed unto you. Lord, help us to stand true for the faith in the midst of persecution or whatever it may be. But, Lord, help us to just draw close to you. And, Lord, if there's anybody here today that has not called upon you for salvation, Lord, please let today be the day of salvation. Lord, let them realize that, you know what, I've been holding on to the wrong things for too long. And I'm ready to give my life to Christ. Lord, if there's anybody here that needs to do that today, let them come see me. And I'll show them from the Bible what it means to have eternal life. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as the music begins to play. If God's working with you in any area of your life, I'd encourage you to come forward. And just say, God, I've been holding on to this. I've been resisting that. I've been running to this. I've been running away from that. And Lord, I promise now that I'm going to hold to you. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to run to you. If you've not called upon Christ for salvation, please, please do not let another day go by without calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The song is very accurate. Every hour I need thee. All right. It's time now for our offering. You may be seated. The men will come forward. This is our regular offering. This goes to the furtherance of the gospel. Looks, oh, there we go. Thought you were flying solo for a minute there. <laughs> All right. So we'll take this offering now. If you're just visiting today, please don't feel obligated to give, but as the Lord leads. But for the rest of us, uh, this goes to the furtherance of the gospel. And uh, thank you for remaining faithful and the giving and the opportunity to give. So, Paul, will you please pray over the offering? Can I have you come forward for the benevolence fund offering? Now it's time for our benevolence offering. Thank you much for that. Uh, also, I mean, this is the opportunity where we make it public to be able to give to the benevolence fund. But if that's something you want to do, maybe there's a time you thought, oh, I wanted to do that today, or there's been another time, you can give to that anytime. Just put a note on your envelope there. The people that count know uh, to put it in that account. Also, uh, you can give uh, through the uh, QR code. Um, that is safe and secure as well. And you can put a note in there as far as benevolence if that's something you wish to do. Uh, but again, thank you to those who give and of course to our benevolence fund to help those within and without the church. Bill, will you please pray for the benevolence fund?
All right, that's it for today. Good to see everybody here today. If you can come back tonight, I encourage you to come back. Let's be an encouragement to those boys uh, as we uh, have our time. Of, well, and the girls. There'll be some girls serving too. I'm sorry about that. But we'll have a popcorn, ice cream, some punch, some good stuff. But also, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 31, all right? The last chapter of 1 Samuel. Uh, we're closing out that book, and we'll see what ends up happening to King Saul and his sons. As the title of tonight's message is... A culmination of consequences. All right, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to serve you and, and worship you today. So Lord, I just pray that you're keeping everyone safe as they go home. And Lord, and those that are traveling on vacation or whatever it is they're doing, keep them safe as well. Uh, but Lord, bring us back here tonight, ready to worship you and to have a wonderful time of fellowship. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.